It's really great privilege and honor to introduce my friend and colleague in matters of Al Qaeda, uh, Josh Meyer, who was a long time uh, correspondent for LA Times and shared in a couple of Pulitzers there. Uh, now is the lecturer and director of education and outreach at the Nas for national security at Medill's Washington program. Uh, Josh is going to talk about some of the highlights of, of his book, which is uh, an incredibly good read. And uh, it's called The Hunt for KSM, for people watching on C-SPAN who want to go and buy it right now, please. Uh, and uh, over, over to you, Josh. Um, thanks, Peter. Uh, Peter and I actually go way back to, um, I don't know if we met before 9-11, but uh, we're two of the reporters who were writing about it, I guess, before it was fashionable. I remember back then it was a whole different landscape. Uh, it was a lot easier to talk to some people. Uh, about this. There were people that were very concerned about it. Maybe it was harder to talk to some other people, but I remember that uh, before 9-11, uh, for instance, I was only allowed to use one Abu per story because my editors <laughs> thought, that, thought that it would be too confusing. Um, it was actually hard to get some of the stories on the front page. Uh, I remember doing one in the summer of 2001 about how Al-Qaeda had uh, changed its focus and appeared to be intent on attacking inside the United States now instead of targets overseas. And uh, my editors, who hopefully won't be listening to this, didn't uh, want to put it on the front page, so I had to call the managing editor. We finally got it on the front page, and 9-11 happened uh, um, 10, 11 weeks later. Um, so ever since then, I've been following Al-Qaeda and, and, and terrorism, much as Peter has. Um, and starting in 2002, I got a tip. We, we mentioned this in the prologue of the book, that I was in a bar in uh, New York City, uh, talking to a bunch of agents who were from the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force there. And uh, in comes the Pent Bomb Squad, which was the, the investigators for the actual 9-11 plot. And so after talking for hours about everything but terrorism, because they couldn't talk about the investigation, I said, you know, give me a tip, give me a, something to go on, a lead, a name. And one of them looked around and said, sort of in a stage whisper, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. I wrote it on a cocktail napkin and started making calls the next day. Um, and the reason I mention that is because, you know, writing about Al-Qaeda and, and Osama bin Laden, um, Peter's book, I can't wait to read, which is coming out, uh, Ayman Zawahiri, all the others, KSM to me always st um, stood out as somebody that was much different than the others. He just seemed much more politically oriented. He, he just seemed to have a sense of humor. He just seemed like he liked to have a good time. He was just much more fascinating. And while bin Laden and Zawahiri and many of the others stayed in their compound in Afghanistan, uh, KSM was the one who really was traveling around the world, uh, getting things done, doing things, um, and, and it just really fascinated me because even, I think it was almost exactly 18 months after 9-11 when he was finally brought to ground. So, you know, I just started thinking in 2002, you know, how did he get away with it for so long and what was he doing all that time? Uh, and even more importantly, who, was, who, if anybody, was chasing him and what were they doing to try to catch him before 9-11? So that was the genesis of the book, and, and I teamed up with my um, co-writer at the LA Times, um, Terry McDermott, to, to do a very long profile of KSM back in 2002. Um, we were fortunate enough back then, uh, this is before he was caught, obviously, to, uh, to speak to people um, who were involved in the chase, to talk to ISI frontline officials and people at the top, top levels of the ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence Service, uh, to try to get a sense of what was happening. And, and I've been following the case on and off ever since. So to talk about the book, um, you know, some of the things that we touch on in the book are uh, how officials at the FBI and the Department of Justice in the years before 9-11 um, actually undermined uh, the protracted, uh, protracted global hunt for KSM in part because it was too expensive. Uh, there was a group of very dedicated off, uh, officers, agents uh, of the FBI and the Joint Terrorism Task Force in New York who literally chased KSM around the world starting in 1993 after they, they identified him as one of the uh, financiers of the first World Trade Center attacks. And that quickly led to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the uncle of uh, Abdul Basid al Karim, otherwise known as Ramzi Youssef. Uh, and they started chasing him then. They followed him to the Philippines, to Malaysia, to, uh, uh, to Qatar, where they almost caught KSM in 1996. Um, they kept chasing it, but somehow or other in the late 90s, he disappeared, went into Afghanistan. And, and one of the big um, failures to connect the dots um, in the 9-11 attacks, which I think we try to articulate in the book, um, is how did they not make the connection that KSM 
uh, was part of Al Qaeda, and and Ali Sufan I know was here speaking in this forum, and he was one of the people that that said we we had no idea that uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was part of Al Qaeda until uh, March or April of 2002 when they caught Abu Zubaydah in Pakistan, and he almost by chance, uh, literally by chance, identified him as Mukhtar, who was a guy they were looking for. But so we tried to go back and and tell this as a story. I mean, I like Peter. Um, and others in the audience have read so many books on terrorism, uh, having covered it as a beat, that the one thing uh, we didn't want to do was um, foist on the public another uh, tome, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to discredit or, uh, or criticize the others. They're very important books, but we wanted to just tell a story about the hunt for KSM, the people chasing him. And, and it wasn't an unintended consequence, but it was through the investigation of that that we really were able to I think tell also the story of how 9-11 came to be and how people missed, missed it and how they missed the attack. And one of the ways they did that was the FBI people that were chasing KSM in the, in the late 90s um, really got um, sideways with their bosses because they were focusing on what was seen to be a cold case, an isolated case uh, connected to some terrorist plots in, in Malaysia. Uh, excuse me, in Manila, uh, the Philippines in, in the mid-90s. Bojinka was a plot to hijack, uh, or excuse me, to, to blow up 12 airliners in, in mid-air as they were flying across the Atlantic to, to the United States uh, to kill the Pope, to kill President Clinton. But, you know, by 1998, certainly, even the New York field office was focused on, on Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda so much that KSM sort of fell by the wayside. And we also try to articulate in the book how the CIA, too, had a bin Laden station, but they were not focused on KSM because he wasn't considered to be al-Qaeda. Um, and the, the rendition unit that was chasing KSM or was in charge of, of his portfolio didn't have the analytical capabilities uh, that the bin Laden station did. Um, so there's, you know, there's many reasons why KSM was never caught. One of them is just that he himself is an extremely clever a uh, charismatic guy who had as many as 60 aliases and could travel uh, with a network of support that he built. I think one of the most important things that we talk about in the book is that um, KSM was instrumental in a lot of other things besides 9-11. He um, helped spearhead an underground railroad of sorts of al-Qaeda people from Afghanistan back into Pakistan right after 9-11. Uh, it was his connections with the jihadi underworld in Pakistan that really helped al-Qaeda regroup in Pakistan because, you know, as, as most of you in this, in this audience knows, um, you know, bin Laden and many of his core uh, inner circle are, are Saudis and Egyptians and it's very hard for them to operate in a place like Pakistan where people speak Urdu. They're at the mercy of, of their hosts, same as it was in Afghanistan. And so KSM was really a link between them and the Pakistani underworld militant groups like Jaishi Muhammad and Lashkar-e Taiba and, and that was how they were able to survive after 9-11. Um, in fact, it was after KSM was captured that they went to the tribal areas uh, because, you know, in part because they just felt like the cities like Karachi were sort of too inhospitable to them at that point. So there's a lot of other, um, I actually wrote something that's maybe eight pages, but you don't want to hear all, all of this. I think the best information comes out during questions. But, you know, I think that a lot of the information in the book um, is character driven. Um, there's a guy, Frank Pellegrino, who was an FBI agent who, I think when he thought that I was, um, when I was writing a book about this, I think that the people that I was focusing on in the FBI, and also to a lesser degree the CIA, thought that I was going to really um, drop the hammer on them and, and really ha have this be a book that, that criticized them sharply for what they did. But in reporting it, what we found was that the, the small group of people that were chasing these guys from 93 on really in, in some ways were true American heroes in the sense that they were trying to do everything they could to catch them, and they run, ran into obstacles uh, from within the FBI, they ran into obstacles from the CIA, certainly from the governments of Pakistan and Qatar who uh, weren't uh, very hospitable or helpful in their requests. Um, so there were a lot of reasons why they didn't catch them. Um, certainly mistakes were made, leads weren't followed. Um, I know that these agents in particular um, have had many, many sleepless nights because they wonder <coughs> which questions they should have asked that they didn't or who sh they should have talked to. So anyway, I hope you read the book. There's a lot of information in there that takes too long to explain now about the creative techniques they used. Um, they followed one guy, Jamal Khalifa, around literally for years 
in the mid 90s and, and were able to get a hotel room above and one below his or an apartment complex and listen to him for years just to see what he was saying. And I asked them, well, why were you following, following Jamal Khalifa, not KSM? And they said, well, that's because we didn't know where KSM was. I also said, well, Jamal Khalifa was Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law. How do you not know then that, that it's an Al-Qaeda operation or that KSM is part of Al-Qaeda? And they have a very good answer for that, which would take too long to explain, but it's, but it's in the book. Part of it is that you know back then, there were a lot of different operations um, that sort of different characters, and bin Laden was only one of them, and so was his organization. And I think that if there's one real takeaway from the book, it would be that um, you know it's not a monolithic organization like Al-Qaeda um, that's really dangerous, um, although certainly bin Laden you know, was, a, was a force of nature and you know, brought together all the groups that became Al-Qaeda and was responsible for a lot of plots. But in many ways, it's, it's a guy like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed who can sort of come out of nowhere um, and he was the one who brought the plot to, to Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden initially didn't um, think it was a good idea. KSM was fairly persistent. And then he kept um, an independence from Al-Qaeda. He, he refused to swear an oath of allegiance or buy out to, to Al-Qaeda until after 9-11, I believe it was, um, because he wanted the independence to do the plot his way uh, and to bring it somewhere else if he thought that Al-Qaeda wasn't going to um, have the, um, you know, the, the backbone to do it, I guess is the best way to put it. So um, in many ways, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, I don't think gets the credit that he deserves um, as you know, the single most deadly terrorist of our times in terms of actually personally being responsible for executing attacks. Um, so I think that with that, it's probably best to... Let's drill down a little bit on the question of um, yeah. KSM's sort of involvement in 9-11 versus bin Laden's, because you say that bin Laden said it was not a good idea. I think. By that you mean I th um, that the tactics that KSM were suggesting weren't um, exactly right, but the, I mean, bin Laden, I think, strategically wanted to attack on the United States, right? Right. Um, and I think that, you know, these two guys um, had very big egos, and there's a lot of, um, I think that there was a lot of sizing e each other up. I remember uh, many people telling me that, um, that KSM wasn't even sure that he wanted to work with bin Laden, and that it was only after the... Uh, embassy uh, bombings in Africa in 1998 that he said, you know, you know, I'm going to try this again and I think that, that you know, that we can work together. But, um, but I don't think, um, if you, in, and I think KSM has even said this in Guantanamo, I don't think he ever thought that he worked for bin Laden. I think he worked with him and that they were sort of, he was an independent contractor. Uh, but yes, bin Laden um, uh, played some role in it. I think Khalid Sheikh Mohammed initially wanted 10 planes uh, attacked and, that, and bin Laden said that, um, you know, it should be more manageable. Um, there's some parts in the book, and also I wrote some stories at the LA Times about this where um, uh, it was one of the most read stories I wrote in terms of people passing it along was that KSM thought uh, bin Laden was a really bad boss. I think I might have made the reference to a Dilbert cartoon um, because um, bin Laden was meddling in certain things. He wanted the plot moved up to the summer of 2001. Um, and KSM said, you know, it's not ready yet and we want to wait until uh, September uh, because his on-the-ground commander, Mohammed Atta, thought that we should wait till Congress is back in session. And he wanted to move the plot up because Ariel Sharon was visiting D.C. at that time? I think so, yeah. But, um, but so there was a lot of pushing back and forth. And, and I think the, 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 the bottom line is that um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed thought that the plot just wasn't ready. I mean, and he was, like any good manager, was relying on his he was good at delegating responsibility, and in that case, he just was relying on Mohammed Atta, who, who was giving him instruction. Now, Yossri Fuda was able to find KSM a year before the CIA was. How, how did that happen, and um, why did the CIA um, take so long to, to yeah. find him, relatively speaking? And a sort of, Ron Suskin has a story which um, I'd like your, to get your take on, mm -hmm. which is that Yossri Fuda worked for Al Jazeera, which is owned by the Qatari royal family. Mm -hmm. And Susskind has a vivid story of the em emir of Qatar calling George Tennant mm -hmm. to say, you know, yeah. by the way, this guy is here. Well, let's start with that. Is that story true? Um, I think it is in, in many respects. Um, there, there's other things in that, in, that our book differs from Tennant's book in. I'm, I'll just leave it at that. Like, but I think that um, um, we were able to get a broader picture by talking to a, a larger set of people than, uh, you know, the CIA, but... Um, well, just, but to, just to drill down on that, so mm -hmm. the owner of Al Jazeera, 
calls uh, the CIA director to tell him, I have a reporter of mine has done an interview with KSM, mm -hmm. and I'm giving you information about where he is. That story is true? It's the, the broad outlines of that are true, I believe. Um, you know, well, I have I, never, I've never talked to Yossery about that, so... Um, well, Yossery says that he doesn't know. Right. Um, my understanding is that it was done without his knowledge because Yossery is a very... Um, um, well, of course, it would be not only would be incredibly dangerous for any right. Al Jazeera reporter if that right. was the case, and it would that be incredibly damaging to Al Jazeera's reputation as an independent... Right. Right. Um, I think that the information was conveyed somehow. It's not clear whether it was done in a meeting, personal meeting, but, and I do know that's what I was starting to say is that Yasser is a very ethical reporter and I don't think that he would do that, but somehow or other the information was conveyed um, and that it ultimately got to the CIA. Uh, but you raised a very important question, which is how did Yasser find uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? And that's, that's not what happened. It was actually the other way around, that Khalid, that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed um, sent out, um, basically invited uh, Yasseri to Karachi to meet with him, and he was taken on a very circuitous route, and all of a sudden he's, he's you know, opens the door and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ranzi bin al are there, and he spent two days with them interviewing them, and that just goes to show, to me, a couple of things. One, you know, how egotistical Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is, but also how brazen he was in, in Karachi. I mean, we talked to somebody who uh, was familiar with that incident who said that KSM uh, literally walked uh, the reporter uh, down the stairs of the flat and out onto the street when he left. Um, and, you know, um, one thing that I will always remember that um, a senior uh, ISI person told me uh, back in 2002 was that, that the ISI has Pakistan so well covered that you can't smoke a cigarette on any street corner in Pakistan without us knowing what brand it is. And I always remember that because if that's the case, then why couldn't you find these guys, uh, which well, raises I, a lot I, of questions. I think that's overstating yeah. ISI's capabilities. Yeah. But yeah. Um, um, not that they don't have capabilities, but yeah. it took the CIA 10 years to find bin Laden. Right. And they have some capabilities too. Yeah. Um, Frank Pellegrino is the KSM case agent who's mm -hmm. sort of the, one of the key characters in the book. Right. Um, Tell us a little bit about him and tell us also, um, I mean, here is the, one of the leading experts on KSM who wasn't allowed to speak to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed for many, many, many years, yeah. even though he was in American custody. What, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. And what were the, um, um, and was that a good idea? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I think that that, um, he was one of the most um, um, compelling figures for me in this whole thing. Um, I mean, he's almost a figure of Shakespearean, uh, tragedy uh, type proportions. He was a very uh, idiosyncratic agent who had been an accountant, decided to join the Bureau, um, got his law degree in his early years, and then was one of the guys who was asked to help out on the first World Trade Center investigation. And because he was fairly new, he got uh, att assigned to follow a guy named Rashid, who you know they didn't think was important at the time, but he turned out to be Ramzi Youssef. And so he started following KSM in 93, uh, but to s sort of fast forward to, to get to the point, um, um, you know, Frank is a very, very good agent. He's a very dogged agent. He, uh, everybody always described him to me um, as saying, well, you got to talk to Frank, you know, and <laughs> I'd say, well, you know, describe him for me. And they said, well, he's, he's about as un-FBI agent as you can get. And everybody who said that, I would say, well, why is that? And they said, well, you just have to know Frank. But, but you know, he <laughs> bucked authority. He actually got um, in a lot of yeah, yelling matches, as we say in the book, with John O'Neill, the guy who's essentially lionized and, and made almost into a hero uh, for his single-handed pursuit of bin Laden. But, uh, you know, as we say, that his um, tunnel vision on bin Laden and al-Qaeda in the late 90s um, made it very hard for Frank Pellegrino and his partner uh, to, to pursue their investigation into Khalid Sheikh Mohammed mm. all that time because he wasn't considered to be al-Qaeda. But um, after 9-11, um, Frank was in Malaysia at the time, and we have a scene where he's talking to his former partner, and they knew immediately that, they, that it was an al-Qaeda attack, they said, and he wanted to join in the hunt. He was doing some counterterrorism work then, but he wasn't allowed to pursue, uh, to join in the specific investigation into K uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Um, and even more frustratingly, um, uh, after K KSM was caught, uh, he tells his wife, you know, they're going to really need me. He was summoned to headquarters in Washington, uh, and drives down there, and, um, and they didn't use him uh, in the interrogation of KSM. They also didn't use him uh, in some of the efforts to mine the information that, that KSM had. I mean, we have a scene where he's in the basement of the FBI building weeks after Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is caught, 
and he's going through, you know, Xerox, you know, pieces of paper of pocket litter, what they found in KSM's pockets and emails and so forth. And another agent says, you know, Frank, what are you doing here? You should be out on the front lines, you know, interrogating this guy. Um, but I think that that speaks volumes. Just to clarify, mm -hmm. I mean, he wasn't allowed to, uh, to in uh, interrogate right. KSM because the FBI wouldn't allow any FBI agents right. to yeah. interrogate. Well, I was just getting to that. I mean, that yeah. speaks to the larger problem, which was that the FBI and the CIA were, were at such, you know, odds with each other that the FBI effectively took itself out of the interrogation uh, regime because they didn't think that, you know, there's, this story has been very well told, but, you know, they thought that they were using methods that were bordering on torture, as Ali Soufan said. Um, and so the FBI wouldn't let its agents allow, uh, allowed into these interrogations, but also I think the CIA um, went out of their way to try to do it themselves anyway, so that there was a lot of, um, uh, tension and conflict between the two agencies. So the FBI, um, to a large degree, um, didn't play a role in any of the interrogations of these guys. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, there were people at the highest levels of the FBI that were saying, this is crazy, this guy here literally logged 400,000 miles, you know, building an indi a criminal indictment against KSM. He's an, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of him. Uh, you need to let him in the room with KSM when he's being interrogated. Did Even that ever happen and it, ne it, it happened finally in 2007, uh, after KSM and the um, others were brought to Guantanamo. Um, and because of some adverse court opinions and, and other information, the Bush administration said, well, we really need to, to do something here. We're probably gonna have to build some sort of case against them. So they sent in these FBI, uh, these clean teams, FBI agents and, and criminal investigative task force agents uh, to essentially rebuild the cases. And I think that that's very important because that's one of the building blocks, if not the building block, for the case that's going to be going forward now in Guantanamo. Uh, Frank and other agents were able to, to interview uh, KSM and Hambali and, and others um, down in Guantanamo. And um, there are some great scenes, if I may say so, in the book about how Frank finally gets to face off against uh, his nemesis, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, in 2007. Um, and, you know, he, Obviously, he's got a lot of strong feelings for Muhammad, um, but he started by being very friendly and open because as the traditional FBI way of building rapport with your target, um, you know, you want to be nice to them so they can talk to you. And so Pellegrino explained uh, to KSM, you know, I was the guy who was chasing you in Pakistan, and I was the guy chasing you in Qatar and in the Philippines. And, and Khalid Sheikh Muhammad looks at him and he says, um, ah, so you were the one. And he even told Pellegrino that um, when they almost caught him in Qatar in, two, in 1996, that, uh, that KSM even knew which hotel Pellegrino was staying in. So he relayed to somebody when he left that interview that it was sort of chills going down his spine, uh, that um, he sort of felt like he had been the hunted instead of the hunter. So. To what extent did the Bureau cooperate with the book? And is Pellegrino still in the Bureau? Frank is still in the Bureau, yeah. Um, I would say that, um, well, um, there were times when uh, I actually said to certain people at the FBI, do you really want the front page of the, the first page of the book to say this is the book the FBI didn't want you to read? Um, because uh, part of it is institutional um, uh, bureaucratic inertia. Some of it's institutional resistance to talking to the press. But I would, I would not say that the, 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 the Bureau was overly forthcoming uh, <laughs> in talking to us about it. Um, in the end, we were able to get, and also I think part of it is they were very, very concerned that the people involved in the investigation, um, um, you know, not compromise anything that could impact the uh, prosecution in Guantanamo or in the civilian court of these guys. I would only add, and I don't mean, actually I do mean to speak cryptically, that um, you'd have to read the book to see um, who we ultimately talked to, and I think we were successful in, in getting the story. How useful was WikiLeaks for you in building up the story of KSM and post 9 11, because it seems that the, there was a lot of material in there about KSM and his network in Karachi. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, and again, we have to, I have to be careful about this. Um, there was, those documents are a really valuable trove of information. Some of that stuff can be obtained elsewhere through talking to people and, and things, but, um, but no, it was fortuitous that those documents had been released, I think. Um, I think that they really helped show. Um, a picture of what was going on at the time. Um, part of it, I think, was just, you know, um, if, if, if you, the hard part is getting all the different sides of a story, you know, the, the CIA version, 
the FBI version, the Pakistani version, and I can tell you, and you, I'm sure you know this as well or better than I do, that um, especially when you're talking about something that happened in Pakistan, there's usually 15 different versions of what happened, including the capture of KSM, I think. Well, final question, what happened with the capture of KSM? How did that happen? How did that go down without giving away too much of the book? Um, you know, I think part of it is a, a, a success story of the CIA. I think by, by, by that time, the FBI and the CIA were so um, much in conflict with each other that they were virtually not working together. In fact, if you talk to the FBI, they'll say that they played no role in the final capture of KSM. On, on this issue or just writ large at the time? Well, basically, there were, there were a few people. A lot of this is personality driven. There, were, there was a CIA station chief, and again, this is in the book, um, a CIA station chief uh, in Pakistan uh, Robert Grenier, um, uh, and an FBI uh, assistant legal attache who got along very well, and they, they worked well together. But once those two left, um, and, they, and the hunt for KSM was really heating up, it's sort of unfortunate because they happened at the same time uh, in the summer of 2002, uh, the relationship really degraded to the point where the FBI believes that the CIA wasn't even looking um, in the right places uh, or talking to people like KSM's nephew um, or looking for KSM's nephew um, in a way that would have led to KSM back then. But um, in terms of the final capture uh, of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, I think part of it is uh, that they developed um, an informant who was very helpful in being able to uh, be inserted into KSM's inner circle, and he led them to them. But it's, as with everything else, it's a lot more complicated than that. We go into some detail in the book about how they were using... Um, uh, you know, tracking de uh, sort of NSA type um, listening devices. Uh, KSM was using a particular kind of uh, cell phone chip that um, I think he thought was secure, but it turns out that it wasn't. This is the Swiss, yeah. the Swiss cell phone yeah. chips. That yeah. And why, 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 were, why did they think it, they, these were secure? Because the way they were purchased was um, uh, in bulk, and you don't have to like give your name to it. So it's, you know, I think KSM was a fanatic about. Um, operational security, and that's one of the reasons he was able to stay on the lam for so long. But I think that they thought that if there was no way you could trace the actual purchase of the chip back to somebody, <coughs> that if you only used it sparingly, you would be able to, um, to you know, avoid capture. I remember Yasri Fuda, for instance, I think he said that as soon as he came in to meet with KSM and, and Ramzi Ben al -Shib, that um, that they took the battery out of his cell phone and the and the SIM card and, and so forth. So uh, I believe that it was just good detective work, and I think the Swiss and the Germans um, and others helped on that. So you had an informant, you had some uh, you know electronic eavesdropping. I think the Pakistanis helped to a degree. Um, so it was a combination of figures. Uh, but in the end, and I think this is where our book differs from the Tenet George Tenet book. Um, I think Tenet says that KSM grabbed a rifle and started shooting. Um, and everybody that I've talked to, at least the, the version of events that we came to believe is true, is that KSM was just captured in his sleep. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why he looks so groggy in that photo. That was, that, that was like the one really great piece of public diplomacy that yeah. the United States has ever done, the, the perp photo. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, that photo actually was caused me a lot of um, heart, I don't know if heartburn's the word, but you know, you, there was a lot of, as with, again, everything else that happens in Pakistan, you know, we spend an inordinate amount of time tracking down whether KSM was actually captured somewhere else and then brought to that house, you know, because, you know. What did you conclude? Well, I mean, he was captured in one, it, I think he was captured where, where the official version says he was. But, um, you know, Christina Lamb, who's a very good reporter, did a great story back then about how she was taken through that house by the guy's mother, Abdul Qadus. Uh, and and she said there's no wall in this house that looks like the wall um, behind the one where he was you know photographed so you know how could he have been captured here and I think what as we say in the book um, the photo was taken later when he was in a safe house um, when they didn't you know they wanted to sort of muss up his appearance and take a, a photo of him that was less flattering than um, some of the other ones so you know it, it, I think it's you know Robert Mueller the FBI director once said about 9/11 um, he said you know this is one of those things where um, we're probably going to be finding out um, important pieces of information 30 years from now. I mean, it's just, you, you know, you think you know the whole story and it's going to take a really long time to find out everything. So I don't think we, we um, answered all the questions, but I think we answered the, the basic ones. Um, so, I mean, I'm still very curious as to how Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was able to operate in Karachi 
uh, starting in, I think, 1990 or maybe 1991, um, certainly through 93, and then go back and forth from Karachi to wherever he was going um, uh, without, you know, anybody finding out where he was. Great. So well, let's throw it open to questions. If you have a question, please uh, identify yourself and wait for the microphone. We'll start okay. over here and back. Yes, uh, John Mueller from uh, Ohio State and the Cato Institute. Uh, you talked a bit about the uh, uh, the plot on Clinton and the Pope. Uh, were th besides 9-11, could you give some s sketch of what uh, terrorism was carried out by KSM? Were any of them, did they reach fruition and were they successful? Mm -hmm. um, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I think even if even in the paper two days ago, the Sajid Badat case, who was the the other shoe bomber with Richard Reed, he just testified in court in New York and was talking about how he and Richard Reed were working directly for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, right. Um, no, in terms of, he, he was involved in an extraordinary number of plots. Um, he was very creative. A lot of them, um, and I hate to keep referring to it, but you know, we go into great detail in the book about which plots worked, which didn't, but also about his mindset. I mean, he was literally like coming up with plots all the time, you know, and some would work, some wouldn't. Um, I think one of his uh, biggest, um, um, I hate to use the word contribution because that's positive, but one of the most important things he did was help set up uh, terrorism cells, um, you know, here and there. I mean, he was instrumental in helping Jama Islamia in, in, in Southeast Asia come into the Al Qaeda fold or at least have a nexus with them. Um, I mean, I think he helped finance the Bali bombings. He certainly had a direct role in the Jerba Tunisia bombings in which I think 20 people were killed. Uh, it was a synagogue off the coast of Tunisia. Um, I think that there was um, a lot of information we had that he was uh, directly, um, or some of his lieutenants were invo involved in the Saudi Arabia bombings in 2003, where I think Peter and I had a nice lunch one day in, in a, um, uh, one of the um, royal family's um, big dining halls. Uh, we were both there after they, remember the attacks, and at that time we didn't know, we just knew it was Al Qaeda. But later, it, I mean, just in the reporting of this book, we came to realize that um, I think it was Mansur Jabara, um, one of the, the names <laughs> run together, but uh, that some of the people that had been working for KSM were involved in those plots. So I think that there were a tremendous amount of them. Um, the plot against the Pope and, and against President Clinton, um, it's hard to tell how uh, close to fruition they were. I do know that when they, uh, in, um, when they searched the room where they uh, were plotting all of this, which caught fire, uh, um, serendipity, serendipitously for law enforcement, they found uh, um, papal robes and other things that indicated that they were at least <laughs> trying to get um, uh, close. It was also, they had picked an apartment that was on the route that the motorcade would go through. So, um, I mean, they were certainly fairly, um, uh, uh, um, what's the word, um, um, eager to try to do this, so. Josh, what, what do you assess KSM's motivations to be? Um, you know, I think that um, that's one of the most fascinating things about the upcoming trial, um, if and when it happens, is, um, is how uh, eager KSM is to tell the world what his motivations are. And I think that um, that's one reason in the book uh, we have the transcript, verbatim transcript, at the back of his um, very long um, uh, soliloquy at Guantanamo in 2008 is, you know, he, to me he was much more uh, political than, than bin Laden. Um, I mean, I know you literally wrote the book on bin Laden, and I think... But bin political Laden, in a sort of secular, right. national, Israeli, anti-Zionist... Right. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, bin Laden had po um, political um, issues too, but I think that KSM is a much more secular guy. I think he is not what you would call a radical, fire-breathing fundamentalist. I mean, um, when he was in the Philippines, there's a lot of stories that he would hang out in karaoke bars and... <coughs> what do, you, do you think uh, those are accurate? Well, I was just going to get to that. Um, it's hard to tell if he was using that as part of his uh, cover or whether he really enjoyed himself. I mean, I talked to one, <laughs> one person who said that all the times he was in, in, um, uh, in the Philippines, he drank buckler beer, which is a non-alcoholic beer. But um, whatever, he was, he was enthusiastically pursuing that persona. Um, and one of the most fascinating things that we got was that one of the ways they tracked KSM to Cutter uh, was that he really liked one of the bar girls in the Philippines, and so he would send her letters and cards and things. And he sent her a Christmas card, I think it was one year. Um, and so the two FBI agents, Frank Pellegrino and, and his, his buddy, who was a Port Authority detective, Matthew Bashir, they'd go back and forth and do a lot of dogged police work, and they would talk to the 
the bar girls and their families. And, and one day they were talking to the mother of one of the bar girls and she said, well, you know, I have some, some letters from, you know, to, to my daughter. And one of them, a couple of them were from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. One was a card and, and the return address was whited out. And so they, they sent it to an FBI lab. Um, and sure enough, the return address was uh, the Ministry of Water and Electricity, I believe, in Qatar. So that's one of the ways they found him. So, you know, he liked, you know, he liked uh, women enough to certainly pursue that kind of thing. So, but it's, you know, I think it's, it's part of what a complex character he is. When they caught um, uh, Ramsey uh, bin al Sheba or bin Sheba, however you pronounce it, in 2002, they found a suitcase with a lot of you know, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's belongings in it, and, and they found photos in there of him playing with his kids that seemed to be very recent. Um, so all the while he's, you know, this terrorist mastermind, he did try to make time to, you know, have playtime with his children, and um, I mean, I think he's sort of a ball of contradictions. I don't know if that answers your question. Do you, but tell everybody, you know, um, the nearest point at which, you know, and maybe if KSM had been found, you know, mm -hmm. arrested in Qatar, maybe 9-11 would have turned out very differently. So yeah. what happened there? Well, I, I personally believe that 9-11 would ne have never happened if, if, um, if KSM had been caught there. I mean, clearly Al-Qaeda would have had other plots and attacks, but, but, you know, this was KSM's baby. This was his plot that came out of the attacks or the plots, excuse me, the plots in, in Manila. And, um, you know, there was good work by the FBI and the CIA that led them to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He was working for the Ministry of Water and Electricity in Qatar. Uh, the, um, one of the members of the royal family in Qatar um, had sort of a, um, I don't know if it's a, a guaranteed employment program, but he had brought a lot of the Mujahideen uh, over to Qatar and let them hang out on a farm just because he thought that they were, you know, an important service to the Islamic world. Uh, KSM was one of them, but he clearly was using his job uh, as a bureaucrat there as a, as a cover and was traveling around the world. And so the FBI, um, very much wanted to get him when they were there. We have a letter from FBI Director Louis Free at the time who was emailing the Qatar government, excuse me, um, writing the Qatar government and saying, you have a very, very dangerous terrorist there. We want to come in and get him and we need your cooperation. And so as we say in the book, there was a lot of back and forth. It went up to the deputies meeting of the National Security Council. And ultimately, instead of doing a snatch and grab um, um, or even pushing him out um, or finding, they were, they were trying to find a way to get him to fly out of the country so they could grab him in another, co in another country. And that, uh, they were working on that. Um, but, but ultimately, um, the, um, uh, the gov U.S. government decided to go through the front door and ask the Qatar government uh, for permission to get him. And, and a lot of people warned them that that wasn't a good idea. And it turns out that it wasn't, that while C Frank Pellegrino and some other uh, agents were on the ground in Pakistan, excuse me, in, in Qatar, uh, trying to get KSM. He slipped out the back door. And he was tipped off. Yeah. Yeah. Gentleman in the back here. Uh, yeah. Hi, Adam Zagger in the Project on Government Oversight. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we've got a book coming out uh, in the very near future uh, by... Uh, Jose Rodriguez talking about uh, the utility of various interrogation techniques. Mr. Rodriguez was the associated with the CIA uh, interrogation of uh, det detainees, including, I believe, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Mm -hmm. Not that he was personally there. Um, what do we know about the interrogation of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? Obviously, the book is about the hunt, not the. Mm -hmm. But what do we know about the interrogation, if anything, uh, or what are the indications? Where did it take place? Did it save many lives and mm -hmm. warn us about future attacks, or what was the utility of that exercise? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that our book, will, and I haven't, I haven't read his book, although I do love the title, Hard Measures. Um, but uh, I would say that our book differs significantly than his on that. We did focus primarily on the hunt, but we do go into some detail about uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's time in custody. And I think that if you talk to some of the people that were involved in this, there's a feeling that, um, that he was very practiced in the art of counterintelligence and counterinterrogation. And, um, you know, that he was very good at knowing the limits of waterboarding and other tactics and that he um, provided them with a tremendous amount of disinformation. I mean, I think he provided them with a lot of information, 
But if you really look at it, um, the attacks that followed shortly after that, the, the, uh, the attacks in Saudi Arabia were in May 2003, which is right after he was captured. You had um, other attacks that followed um, uh, shortly that are after that, and even in the years after that, that were linked to people that worked closely with KSM. Um, so you'd have to think that he knew about those attacks, and, and, and if he did say anything about them, uh, nobody's told me that, um, and um, it certainly didn't lead to them um, stopping those plots. It also didn't lead to the capture of bin Laden or, or Ayman Zawahiri, his number two. Um, we weren't the first to report this, but we were able to confirm that, um, that KSM did meet with Zawahiri the day before he was captured. Uh, so he clearly knew where bin Laden and Zawahiri were, and I think perhaps most importantly, the courier that ultimately led to bin Laden, um, al-Kuwaiti, um, his full name escapes me now, was one of the guys that was working very closely with KSM back then. I'll have to read Peter's book to see if, um, yeah, I believe he was one of KSM's protégés, right. you know. Um, so uh, I think that all of that information certainly KSM had in his, his head, and uh, everything that I understand about it, you know, whether it's, you know, being privy to what was in the, the cables that were coming back. Um, about the interrogations and, and people that were involved in it was that he did not give up that kind of information. So, um, uh, so I don't know how successful it was. Um, if we contrast what you just said with the latter phase. You get a mic, please. If we contrast what you've just said with the latter phase that began in 2007 when they brought in Frank Pellegrino to mm -hmm. do the clean team mm -hmm. cleanup. Uh, to produce evidence that might be useful in a legal prosecution right. conducted by this country. Um, of course, by then, all the, the attacks and the this and the that that, uh, that you had described had already happened, so that wasn't mm. going to be stopped. But um, what about the clean team exercise? Uh, um, I mean, he stopped obfuscating to some extent at that point, as far as we know, or what happened then? Well, you know, whether they got, um, and again, like in terms of operational intelligence and, and whether you can use it to stop plots, I mean, I think that like talking to somebody in 2007 after they've been in custody for <laughs> since 2003, I, I think it's, it's negligible what you're going to get from them. Um, I think at that point they were just trying to build a case against him. But I think one of the things that's most important, which we, a point we tried to make in the book, that I think is, is frequently ignored, or, or um, is that it, it's not just the, the type of interrogation measures, methods you're using, it's who's doing the interrogating. I mean, um, what, what, what never seemed to make sense to me, um, and I know Ali Sufan and a lot of other FBI agents have been screaming about this for years, is even if the, the CIA brought in these contract interrogators to do these interrogations, they had absolutely no background knowledge of Al-Qaeda or who the players were. Um, and you know, when the FBI interrogates somebody, they know everybody who's in your network, uh, who your, you know, what your backstory is, how the various parts work together. And you need that information so that when somebody gives you an answer, you can tell if they're lying or not, or you can tell them what question to ask. And so what they think is that even if the waterboarding and the other methods that they were using uh, on KSM worked, they wouldn't, they didn't know what questions to ask. Um, and, you know. Yeah, Ali Soufan describes that as the tell me what I want to know right. sort of school of interrogation. Right. And, you know, I heard from a lot of people that they would just come in and they would repeat the same question over and over and that it was actually like, well, you know what we want. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> they'd be like, no, actually I don't. Um, so to me, the, and, and as we say in the book, there were three different uh, organizations that were desperately trying, they were reading the cables coming back when KSM was being interrogated, and they were, le they were saying either he's making this stuff up or you're not asking the right questions. And that was the 9-11 Commission, which by then was already investigating this, who had some very smart and, and you know, um, experienced people on that. It was the Criminal Investigative Task Force uh, at Guantanamo who was reading the traffic and saying, you know, you gotta ask him this. And um, f for some reason now, um, I'm forgetting what the third one was. I, it was either the FBI or um, whatever. But these three, you know, entities were saying, "Look, you know, um, he's not. Get, you're not getting the right information out of him. You need to, you need to ask better questions." Um, 
and and the people that I spoke to said that they weren't getting that that those th that even after that they weren't getting the right information out of him. So, um, David Isby. Hi, David Isby. Uh, you've just said something which I found rather disturbing. A guy like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed can come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Now, bin Laden's dead, and the middle ranks of Al-Qaeda have been decimated by the predators, mm -hmm. uh, but I know the subcontinent is full of lots of smart entrepreneurial guys, and groups with their, ra with their roots there have, through Bombay and the Times Square bombing, mm -hmm. shown a transnational reach. Mm -hmm. uh, where is the next threat coming? Is someone like KSM likely to come up with one of these groups, and how can we identify or prevent such a threat? Um, that's a great question, David. I think um, one of the most intriguing people that I, uh, I've focused on since, I think, 2006, um, and at the time I didn't even know this, was one of KSM's protégés. It's a guy named Adnan El Shukur Juma. Um, and I didn't even know this at the time, but, but you know, KSM really liked uh, people that he thought could function in, in, in three worlds, the Arab world, the South Asia world, uh, and the Western world, like, you know, and Shukur Juma, like KSM, spoke Urdu, he spoke Arabic, and he spoke English, and he, you know, spent time in the United States, and I think that... He's an American citizen. Yeah. So I think that he, um, I think people like that, um, I forget if he's a citizen or he's a national. Yeah, I mean, um, he's a, I'm pretty sure he's a citizen. I mean, because yeah. he grew up in the Bronx in Florida. Yeah. Um, but, um, but he was born in Saudi Arabia, too, so uh, mm. that's right, I, I forget my own reporting on that. Um, <laughs> I spent like three weeks in Miami writing about him back in 2006. But, but I think that, you know, A, there's a lot of people that um, are still out there that they worry about that were either trained by people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or others. But you don't need training like that. You, you can just sort of come out of nowhere on your own or from the internet. I think that the Mumbai attacks, for instance, are extremely disconcerting about that. Um, I do think that uh, somebody like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed doesn't come along uh, all that often, thankfully, you know, somebody who's got the sort of, you know, um, sort of obsession with attacking the United States and in, in very creative and new ways. But I think that um, it is scary because I don't know if you, I don't know if, you know, they could be from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula or it could be somebody like Nadal Hassan in, you know, in Texas who just gets radicalized on the Internet. Um, Isn't there a big difference now? I mean, there were 16 people on the no-fly list on 9-11, now the 21,000. Right. We've got TSA, DHS, yeah. all these joint terrorism task forces. I mean, there's a huge amount of intellectual and yeah. financial effort mm -hmm. put at trying to sort of yeah. look at this question. Yeah. I mean, we had KSM presumably in, well, they did take a while even after 9-11 to find it, but I... Yeah. I yeah. It seems implausible that there would be somebody who had a big network that wasn't sort of on the radar right. of, of some American. Yeah. Well, I think that a Al Qaeda would like to call these spectaculars. I think it's harder to do one of those now, certainly in the United States. Um, but you can also do a lot of damage um, as an individual doing some kind of attack. Um, I mean, I remember after right after 9 11, I got a call from somebody saying that if you took out a chlorine tank in the United States with a rocket propel propelled grenade, you could kill, you know, a lot of people, sort of like a Bhopal disaster in India. And well, the I, interesting thing is it's never happened. Right. And I remember thinking, do I even want to write that story because I don't want to give people a good idea? And I remember saying, I'm going to think about it in more in the well, morning. Now you've just told an audience right. of several hundred thousand right. on C-SPAN. So. <laughs> Okay. But, well, no, but the, but the Wall Street Journal did that story like the very okay. next day back in 2002. So I was like, well, I don't have to worry about that ethical issue now. Um, this lady in front. Yeah, my name's Li Yang. I uh, just wonder, you know, uh, FBI, CIA, they search uh, everywhere. It's even people are innocent. Mm -hmm. And so they were arrest or maybe sent to the Guantanamo Bay while they take people's uh, resources away. Why can't they stop? All those are KEDA or KSM, their activity is right from the beginning. And is there anything FBI or CIA, they try to hide all this, this stuff? And how do they really hate American or any, any country they want to fight against? And how soon really do they know whether al Qaeda planned as Osama bin Laden to Pakistan to hide out? I don't know why they cannot find out that instead of why all these uh, years of war. Okay. Um, 
Well, I think that why couldn't they find out that these guys were planning the attacks? I mean, I think that that's, there's a lot of ink that's been spilled on that. Um, and I think that's, but that's one of the reasons we wanted to write the book. Uh, I think that's why Peter wrote um, The Longest War. I mean, I think that history is, you know, the history of this hasn't been, is not finished. I think that the 9-11 Commission did a great report, but that was in 2004. And, and I think that the people that wrote that will be the first to admit that, that, that they didn't have access to certain uh, documents and certain officials and that the history changes. So I think we're still trying to find that out. But I think, you know, I think that um, people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed fell through the cracks and that some of the problems that were in place back then are, are still there now. Well, what happens with KSM on May 5th at Guantanamo? And will you be involved in covering any of that? Um, yeah, I'm hoping to. We, you know, there's 60 spots down there for journalists. Um, and I think that there's 800 people that are applying or so forth. Um, so, uh, but yes, I certainly plan to, to follow it, whether I'm uh, there in, in, in spirit or in, in And in they're also hooking presence. it up at Fort Meade? They're so. in Fort Meade, yeah. Um, you know, I, I've talked to some people uh, recently that have said that, you know, um, you know, that we need as much transparency for this trial as we can. I mean, this is our Nuremberg trial, and this is our way to sort of have a fitting end to the 9-11 era and really put in the public record, um, you know, what happened. I think that, mm -hmm. the, you know, because the government really has never um, done that, where they've done a formal sort of document dump of everything they know about 9-11. And I think that the American public is waiting for that and, and deserves that. Um, uh, I was at the LA Times for 20 years, and one of the cases I covered was O.J. Simpson. Um, and what I like to tell people is if you could have a, if that was the trial of the century, last century, and you could have every minute of it televised, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there are some complications about televising this trial with all the national security issues. But you could do it on a delay um, and have a, a mechanism in place so that um, you give the public uh, um, a view of what happened in the trial and, and what happened in 9-11 uh, in a way that doesn't compromise national security. I mean, I, I'd love to see that. I don't think it's going to happen. Should, it, should the trial have happened in, in the Southern District of New York where the crimes happened? Well, as a reporter, I try to be objective about that. But, okay, um, but you've just written a book, so we're right. asking you a question. <laughs> yes, I do. I, I, uh, <laughs> that's true. Um, uh, somebody told me I've been promoted, um, <laughs> but uh, no, I think so. I mean, I, I was there in the summer of 2001 when the embassy bombings trials were, were um, uh, taking place. I'm actually, I just wrote an op-ed piece, which is, I forgot how torturous it is to, uh, to get an op-ed piece uh, published, but the op-ed piece says, it goes into detail about how when I was there in, in 2001 watching the embassy bombings trial, um, you know, they brought in witnesses from, from Nairobi and you know, um, you know, fr from the two sites where the embassies were attacked, they they brought in the, the victims' families. They brought in um, tons of witnesses. They introduced mountains of information, um, and there were people in the courtroom to point to them and say, you know, from the witness stand and say, those are the guys that I saw at the site. Um, and and I think at the end of that, you really had a sense that justice was done. And, and I don't know uh, if you're going to get that. To follow up on that, was yeah. any national security information? Did any national security information come out of the trial that was not no. supposed to? No, I mean, and as you and know, did, and what were the sentences of the people involved? I think it was like 240 years each, right. something like that. So, um, and you, know, you really had a, you know, and you, you got to hear from the terrorists themselves about why they did it. But you know, I think some people are afraid that if KSM is is going to use the trial to sort of, I hate to use the term hijack the trial, but that he's going to that he's going to use the trial terrible. to like tell people why he yeah <laughs> why he did it. I, I was inadvertent. But, you know, but I don't know if that's a bad thing, having the American public hear what he's saying. I think that the, pe the uh, yeah, you know, people, people are smart us. enough, people are smart enough to know how self-serving it is. And, and, you know, like you, I, I think that by keeping him, and we say this in the book, that by hiding him for so long and refusing to bring him out into the light, um, you almost give him uh, much more of what he wants, which is like a mythical persona. And, and, and I personally think that the, now that I'm allowed to give my opinion, uh, mm -hmm. that the absolute worst thing you can do is, is uh, execute these guys because that they will then become the martyrs that they're trying to, to become. What's really interesting though is, and I've never, we always say that, but I don't think it's true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ben, is Bin Laden a big martyr right now? I mean, he, we essentially a non-judicial right. execution by yeah. the US Navy SEALs. Um, it hasn't happened. I can't think of a single, the only martyr for the movement that I can think of is Sheikh Rachman. Yeah. Who's a, you know, big, but when it's, uh, when it's one of these, people who are more on the fighting side rather yeah. than the religious side, they don't seem to live on as martyrs. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think that there are some people um, who will look at bin Laden's death as sort of a cause for, you know, continuing the, right. the jihad. Um, I mean, I would ask most people if you know what's up with Ramzi Youssef, and I think that, you know, he, he's been locked away in the, um, the prison in, in uh, you know, Fox. Supermax in, in Colorado for, for so long that I think he's just disappeared from the public consciousness, you know. Completely. And, um, um, it's about like being buried alive. Yeah. Somebody told me that they went to visit uh, Ramsey and Supermax and said, hey, Frank Pellegrino says hello. And, and he was like, hey, tell Frank I said hi. <laughs> so, um, you know, because, you know, you know the, these agents spent so much time with them in court and elsewhere that they, uh, you know, they really got to know them. And I think that's important that you know your enemy, not just um, keep them, you know, at a 30,000 foot distance. Other questions? This gentleman over here. The detail, do you know if it's true that he was um, waterboarded 140 times? And, and if it is true, how could he survive such a, such a treatment? Well, I think the official number is 183. 183, um, okay. And that it happened over a period of, of a month, which if you do the math, that's... Um, but, you know, one thing that I don't think the public really is aware of is what, what does that mean? I mean, like, if, if you're lying down and they pour water on you like four times in one session. Is that four water boards or is that one water board? Um, but I think the bottom line is is that, and we have a scene in the book about this, about how KSM is like ticking off his fingers as they're waterboarding him because he knows it's going to stop at like a certain point. I mean, I think that that's a good thing that the United States, whatever you think of waterboarding, was that they were applying the technique so carefully that somebody like KSM could could know that they could only take it to a certain point um, was that like after the 182nd time or? <laughs> I think maybe the 30th time or so. But, you know, I mean, if you waterboard somebody any more than 20 or 30 times, or I think they're probably going to, maybe they're going to get a sense that, you know, that they're not going to die at the end of it. You know, but who knows? I mean, I, I was not there in the room. Um, but, um, you know, I, you know, it's a very controversial tactic. Personally, I think that um, one of the most debilitating uh, tactics that you can use against people is sleep deprivation. Um, I don't know anybody who's like not been allowed to sleep for three days, but um, you know, I saw some video of KSM being um, interrogated after two or three days after he was captured, and, and even then he was he couldn't keep his head up. I mean, and he was just mumbling gibberish. And I mean, it's very and he very was actually kept up for uh, seven, six and a half days straight. I think. Yeah. Well, the CIA <laughs> has some formula that you're allowed to be up for like eleven days or something. I mean, they, they have people that are being paid a lot of money to, to figure out that it's 11 days, not 12 days, or I forget the exact number, but, but there is a number that you're only, you're supposed to stop right there and give him a pillow, I guess, and let him go to sleep. What was your, Terry McDermott, your co-author, and your, your own assessment of mm. the extent to which uh, the pa Pakistanis helped with the arrest or capture of KSM? Um, with, you mean the, with the hunt for him or the final, the final, very final steps? Both. Um, you know, that, you know, having been in Pakistan in 2002, uh, I, I know that, uh, just to take a step back, I think that um, one of the things about writing a book that's different than writing news stories is that if you, the more you report something, uh, the more the black and white issues become gray and, and, you know, there's a lot of nuances and complications. And one thing that we found is that you cannot say that the Pakistan government was, was um, working in league with the militant groups, and that even though there are elements within the ISI, certainly that um, our liaisons to these groups, and in a, in a sense, helped create and train and fund them uh, with our help back when we were fighting the Soviets, um, or you know, in the, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Um, I think what we found was that there were uh, um, a core of very dedicated Pakistanis who were, were working really hard to work with the United States to catch these guys. I mean, we have a couple of what I think are some of the best uh, scenes in the book where um, uh, this Port Authority cop died in the 9-11 in the, in the, in the and they brought his handcuffs with his, uh, they were engraved with his name Mac on them and they brought them to Pakistan at his widow's request and she said use these on the bad guys. And some of the Pakistanis really um, came to look at those handcuffs as sort of a talisman of, of good, good luck and they knew that the guy had a daughter who was born after he died um, and so th it became personal to them that they were helping find the people who did this. And I think that, so there are scenes like that where they're, 
you know, f there were a lot of people that were trying very hard. I mean, there's one colonel who we talk about in the book um, who was extremely um, instrumental in working with the Americans to catch these guys, and they even brought him back to the United States and uh, brought him to Police Week, where the cops like sp spent a couple days getting really drunk. And um, was he um, working for the Intelligence Bureau or ISI? He or was working for the. I mean, the ISI has different um, branches. I mean, they have um, they have a certain branch that deals with the external threat and the internal threat, as you know. Um, and there is one branch that's essentially dedicated to being the handlers of some of the. The, um, the sectarian groups, uh, but these guys were the were sort of the mo local authority, uh, sort of like the local police version of it, I guess. You know, who were um, who were much more. Um, they were they were in a different section of the ISO. So your assessment, just to summarize, is that the Pakistanis were quite helpful in the KSM matter. Some of them were, but um, you know, and, and we there's many instances in the book where um, even the the this one Colonel Tarek, for instance. Um, would work very closely with the FBI, for instance, and but whenever they would go to a scene uh, for a raid, it would be empty. So you know the question was, you know, even if Colonel Tarek was helping, uh, when he telegraphed to other people that he was working with that we're going to do this, you know, were other people um, more sof more effective at being unhelpful than he was at being helpful? Um, so it's complicated, I guess, is the best way to put it. Other questions? Well, we've stumped everybody. Uh, yes. Do you hear my MTS? Just very quickly, um, in 2006 or so, I mean, after KSM got captured, I spoke to some police officials who said that KSM was instrumental in training members of Jundala, the Pakistani version, which were also responsible in the early 2000s for attacks on the core commander, bomb blasts in, the, mm -hmm. in Karachi. So at what point did the Pakistani authorities figure out that KSM was responsible for those attacks, or did it come out much later after he was captured? And the second question is, this is all conjecture, but did KSM actually orchestrate uh, the wedding of his nephew to Afia Siddiqui or not? Did he orchestrate the wedding or officiate at? Well, I mean, officiate or did he, was he the one who told his nephew to marry Afia? Was Afia the one, was, did he ask Afia to marry his nephew? How did it, is there anything in your book that says something about that? You know, those are, the John Dulla thing was something, where there was a lot of, um, blind alleys that we, that, um, I mean, the way Terry and I split it up was I dealt with, or maybe I shouldn't say that, but um, w I dealt with the law enforcement and the intelligence. Terry dealt with a lot of the KSM and his family. Um, so, um, but I also, I was looked into the Jandala thing, um, and it's just such a, mer and, and also like Jamaat Islami, the political party in Pakistan, and whether they have a network of safe houses that have helped Al-Qaeda, and whether they, they're sort of the um, front organization for the ISI, people that are, you know, working with the militant groups. The Jandola thing, to be honest, is one of the things that I was never able to really penetrate, but I would love to talk to you about that afterwards, uh, because I think that there's a lot there. Um, you know, and there's also two Jandola organizations, right? There's one in Pakistan and Iran. Um, and the Afia Siddiqui wedding, who is Afia Siddiqui? Afia Siddiqui is, um, um, I forget the exact term, a neuroscientist who um, became, uh, s somehow became connected to Al-Qaeda. She was living in Boston for a long period of time. She was on the FBI's radar screen. Um, one summer they went to visit her and then like by the next summer she was helping, um, and we go into some detail in the book about this, she was helping um, uh, Majid Khan and um, uh, other people that were in KSM's uh, network of, of um, sort of American sleeper agents uh, set up um, a beachhead in the United States through which they can mount attacks. Um, and so she appears to have been very helpful to Al-Qaeda, at least in the United States. She also, you know, as you know, um, allegedly married uh, KSM's nephew, um, Amar al-Baluchi. Um, but, you know, I think that the, um, you know, even the people that I know that were in charge of investigating a lot of this stuff, I don't think they really know a lot of the answers to that. Um, I, I had never heard <clears throat> that KSM had, have, had officiated at their wedding, but I do know that he was very closely connected to, to all of those people. Um, you know, we, we have, in the book, we have that Majid Khan, who is now the guy who is going to be testifying against KSM, or one of the guys in, in Guantanamo, um, who spent a lot of time in Maryland, uh, that he called uh, KSM Chachi, which is uncle, you know, and that he was very close. And, um, you know, there's some information that we couldn't fit in the book about how much time and effort KSM spent in sort of um, uh, grooming people like him and, and 
and radicalizing them and, and, and urging them to, to sort of come over to the jihadi side. So um, I don't know if that's a very good answer, but, um, but I think that clearly KSM was in that sort of, you know, that Afia Siddiqui knew KSM, certainly knew his, his nephew. Whether the marriage was an um, arranged marriage or something to help her um, once she joined the Al-Qaeda fold, I, I don't know. But maybe you do, so we can talk. Great. Any other questions? I think we'll wrap it up then. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Josh, for a very, really interesting Thanks. presentation. There are books here, and Josh will sign them.